Welcome to this preview video of what is probably the most challenging segment of the poem Beowulf. I'm using Maria Headley's translation, and we're previewing the sort of post-game gathering, the post-battle gathering after Beowulf defeats Grendel in Heorot, the newly safe, newly secure Heorot. I begin this class with Richard Blanco's poem, My Father, My Hands. He was an inaugural poet several years ago. And uh, it's a beautiful poem that deals with lineage in an interesting way. And that's what this, uh, to a large extent, this section of the epic is about. So there's a, a really great article by John Learell called The Interlaced Structure of Beowulf, in which he says, there are no digressions in Beowulf. Most of uh, today's reading is often considered a digression, a almost a distracted you know, the poet gets distracted and tells a story within a story. Maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not. I just want to say the more I teach and the more I read, something that distinguishes a classic from other texts is that when you're reading a classic text, and the classic text maybe was composed 10 years ago, I'm talking about a, you know, a, a sophisticated multi-level text regardless of when it was written or who wrote it, that one of the characterizations of a classic text is that in moments where you're tempted to skim, the author is actually really working on you and that those moments are actually connected to the significant themes of the book. So today's reading is the moment in this entire poem, which would be easiest to not pay attention to. Teachers that teach Beowulf in five or six or seven classes will not spend time, significant time on this reading. But I just think it's a short enough poem that we don't really have to skim anything. And I, I title the presentation Beowulf Digressions and Thanksgiving Dinner because it ultimately comes down to something that you have to decide for yourself as a person and as a reader. I host Thanksgiving dinner every year. Uh, I have no domestic skills other than cooking. So I love, I love making Thanksgiving dinner. It's my favorite day of the year. And every Thanksgiving, we have family over, we have friends over. And as is the case with a lot of families, there are members of my family, my father while he was alive, my mother-in-law, other, my mother, other members of our family that love telling and repeating great family stories so that if you a stranger came to my house for thanksgiving um and we just plopped you on the couch and my mother was in the middle of telling a story about her mother alice and her father stan and how they met in the 1940s um, you wouldn't really know who these people were right? You'd have to get some context and background to figure out who Stan was and who Alice was. Well, that feeling of being a stranger in a strange house, not knowing who all the names are, is what it feels like reading this section of Beowulf for the first time. But ultimately, the question has to be this. Think of your holiday meals and the stories that are told. Let's imagine you have a story about your grandmother that gets told and retold. My question to you is, is that story an essential part of your holiday experience or is it a digression? And in the world of Old English poetry, where everything sort of interlocks with everything else, um, a story about a grandmother and what she did 50 or 70 years ago would be essential to what's going on in the present. And I kind of believe that now anyway. So, you know, if, if you think of moments in a text as digressions, you're just not gonna pay attention to them. So I always like giving authors benefits of the doubt um, and imagining that even things that seem accidental or immaterial or not relevant, imagine they're relevant until you have a reason not to imagine it. It makes the text a lot more dynamic and interesting. So first, there's about six different parts of this reading. Admittedly, it's a bit long. There's a post-fight party. And one of the very first things in line 863 of the Headley translation is that the poet asserts, thought was good kuning, that was a good king, in reference to Hrothgar. Now, 
I asked, why is this so important to assert here? Well, his nation and his meat hall have been repeatedly destroyed. And there's been numerous murders throughout the years by Grendel and Beowulf comes from Sweden to, to, to save the day, an outsider. It would be easy to imagine that Hrothgar therefore isn't a good king, but it's interesting here that the need for Beowulf's heroism doesn't detract from Hrothgar being a good king. And I think a, a really good question now would be, what does that say about heroism and what does that say about being a good king in Beowulf? The second part of the post-fight gathering is a short story and it begins on line 867. So I would mark that section in the margin onto the next page. You get the beginning of Beowulf's tale. Uh, it's interesting, line 871, began to compose the tale of Beowulf. So it's this weird, almost postmodern choice where we're, we're experiencing the poem Beowulf and a character in the poem is telling the story of Beowulf all kind of at the same time, which is kind of funky. Um, but the very first story, think of it as a playlist. Like you might have a workout playlist or a driving to work playlist. This is a victorious battle playlist, right? And, and song number one in the playlist is the song of Sigamund, which begins on page 40 near the top 887. And we learn about Sigamund throughout this whole page and the next page. And Sigamund is a dragon slayer. So Beowulf is connected to other slayers of monsters. And in, in so doing, Beowulf is um, sort of raised in status. Uh, it's sort of like if you're a hockey player being compared to like Bobby Orr, Wayne Gretzky, or Mario Lemieux, like your status would be immediately raised. So that's what's going on in this early stage. Third, we, we pause the storytelling and we get, we get Hrothgar uh, beginning to tell stories and to narrate from the very bottom of page 42. And again, in these preview videos, mark and underline in your book the things that we read aloud because that'll anchor you in your reading. Hrothgar says in the second to last line of page 42, 943, Beowulf, regardless of whether your parents survive, you're my son now. Adoption won by wily work. We know that Beowulf sits between Hrothgar's two sons at the party. We know Beowulf is grateful for this. And uh, that's just a, a, a really interesting thing. And I wonder what Hrothgar's family and own sons, what they're thinking. We don't get their words. But it'd be interesting to imagine maybe an exercise where you write the monologue of one of his sons. Um, maybe they've learned watching, watching Beowulf defeat Grendel with his strength and watching Beowulf defeat Grendel with, defeat Unferth with his words, that Beowulf's not someone you fight either verbally or physically. Then, uh, I hope you appreciate the cookie monster cookie. I was trying to have a diversity of monsters in my presentation. Um, on page 46, we have, um, Hrothgar gives all these interesting gifts to Beowulf, like his own father's sword. I just think of, I think of the ring in Lord of the Rings, um, given by Bilbo to his nephew Frodo. I think of, you know, I think of the lightsabers that are, are really interesting and have interesting family histories in Star Wars. So he gets all these interesting gifts. And at the very end of Hrothgar's speech, he says this in line 1060, it's on page 47. So if you can go to that line 1060, God's in charge always has been, always will be. And anyone who lives long will endure both ecstasy and ugliness. So there's a wisdom in that, that an older person would sort of have. Um, but it's interesting that uh, Hrothgar's gratitude is both to Beowulf's human physical heroism and to sort of being in, in God's favor, which he didn't earn. So that might be worth 
talking about? Like what's interesting about Hrothgar's response? Do you think he's more grateful to Beowulf, more grateful to God? How do these two things go together? It's just something interesting to think about. Now, put on your seatbelts. This is the part of Beowulf that makes people tug their hair out. That's why I'm wearing a hat, actually. Um, the Finsberg fragment, the long story within a story. It's about 100 lines long. So I, I'm going to do what I try not to do. I'm actually going to give you the plot of this because this is a hundred line thousand year example of a sort of family tribal story where everybody at this party in the poem knows what all these names and stories mean. So they can speak in a sort of shorthand. The problem is we don't know we're not in the family. This is almost like wandering into someone else's Thanksgiving and trying to make sense of all these stories. So I'm going to tip you off. And rather than have you worry about figuring out what's literally happening, I'm going to give you what literally happens and then encourage you to ask deeper questions. Okay. First, uh, here's the deal. The Frisians and the Danes are two groups of people. Remember, we're right now in the poem having a party after Grendel's defeat and we're in Denmark. So we're in the homeland of the Danes. So this, this is the, the next song sung at the playlist of the party celebrating Beowulf's victory over Grendel. Do not forget the context. This is a playlist. And the, the Shope, the court poet and historian, is singing this. The Frisians, another group of folks who are here, right, are, uh, and the Danes, do not appear to be on great terms with each other. So leave it at that. Secondly, the Danes, led by Hanaf, are in Frisia, and they're there for sort of truce-like, peaceful purposes. Um, as a way to forge peace, the Danish Schnaff's sister, Hildebert, is married to Finn, who's the king of the former enemy, Frisia. So this, obviously, in history happens all the time. You have a wedding that's meant to sort of forge bonds of peace between two groups of people. So, so far, you have two groups of people who generally, historically, don't get along. And then there's an attempted peace and there's a wedding meant to forge the two communities. Third, during the Danes' visit, they are attacked and Hanaf is killed by some of the Jutes, another group of people, who serve Finn. Good luck keeping track of this, but don't worry. It's believed that the Jutes had an old score to settle with the Danes. So there's rivalries within rivalries. Hildebert's son is also killed. Okay, so the peace... You have moments of conflict and then an attempted peace. Now we're at conflict again. Fourth, after they fight, they agree on a truce for the winter. So we have conflict, truce, conflict, truce. Hengist is the new Danish leader. And strangely enough, the Danes are treated as well as the Frisians. Okay, so things are good. Fifth, Hildebert orders that a funeral pyre is erected for her Danish brother, Hanath and her Frisian warrior son. And you could imagine that this was meant to be a sort of symbolic, a physically symbolic of maybe the two communities coming together. Sixth, as the winter ends, a sword is symbolically laid on Hengast's lap, um, Hengast the Dane's lap, reminding him of his obligatory vengeance against the Frisians. Remember that wear guild man price the fact that you know if someone kills someone in your tribe and they don't pay you for that violence you're obligated to create an equal sort of death on the other side that was fully expected and last but not least hengis leads the danes verse frisians they kill finn take hildeper and ransack finn's hall okay I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this story, but you're going to want to maybe write those notes down somewhere, maybe in your book, maybe in your notes, because this, this story underlying the skeleton of the plot will help you relax as you read this and be a little less confused. Please, if you're my students or not, please, I will not be quizzing you on the ins and outs of the Finberg fragment. Um, we have bigger questions to ask about it, but I just want you to know the 20,000 foot view of this section is about the
the cycle of peace and then violence usually based on vengeance that's remembered and then some sort of peace violence based on vengeance just that cycle over and over this is an older example of that and last but not least Welfeau, Hrothgar's queen offers some really interesting words um, really interesting words to Beowulf starting on page 54 and she says um, in line 1219 guide my two sons guard them keep them as they are tonight and i will keep as you you as you are draped in delights um so that's kind of her her first big instinct when talking to beowulf is um guard my sons i want to point out that might be worth writing about think of the room you have her husband there her her sons there other relatives other key military leaders in Hrothgar's band, and she looks at a foreigner, albeit a heroic one that just killed Grendel, and says, you need to protect my sons. That might be worth thinking about. Um, I think the big question I would ask all of my students to consider once you sort of wrestle with the skeleton of the plot of these crazy stories, Think of the playlist of this celebration. The poet's playlist are a story about a dragon slayer and a story about a cycle of vengeance, violence, and peace. And my question is, this is a time for celebration. Their enemy has been killed. Peace is back. Their stability of their house has returned. Warmth and safety. Why do you think these are the stories for this night? Why is this the playlist? Uh, there's a lot of ink spilled on this and experts don't agree. So feel free to explore the text for your own interpretation. I hope this video helps. And I just ask you that when reading this poem, whenever you're tempted to think of something as irrelevant, read it again. Good luck on your reading and keep in touch.